Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the services of the First Baptist Church of El Paso. To start off, we want to wish you a Merry Christmas. And during this Christmas season, we want to thank you for your support of our television ministry. During the season of the year, we want to give you an opportunity to receive a special gift from our church. If you can make a gift of $25 or more to our television ministry, we'll be glad to send you a copy of the 49th Annual Living Christmas Tree DVD. It'll be a wonderful Christmas program that you'll enjoy. It has wonderful music and the story of Christmas throughout. We think you'll enjoy this gift, and we certainly would appreciate your support. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. So Christmas is the season of imagination. It's a time when we use our imaginations, particularly those of us who are children, and dream about what Christmas is supposed to be about. Remember um, the old poem, "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. The children were all nestled in their beds with visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads." You see, this imagination, this ability to see things that aren't there yet is a gift that God's given us. But sadly, most of us today, we live vicariously through the imagination of others. You know, we go to the movies, we, we watch television, we play video games that other people created the things that we enjoy. I remember the days when my three brothers and I would find a pile of sticks, and immediately we saw those sticks as swords, and we became knights of the round table, and we would battle against each other, or we could turn those same sticks into baseball bats. If Harry Potter would have been around, we would have turned them into wands. Just an old stick could become a great toy if you had a great imagination. When my dad was growing up, he tells me that he used to sit beside the radio, listen to stories of the Green Hornet that were told over the radio, and in his mind, he could create the adventures of the Green Hornet and all that he faced and all that he experienced. You see, imagination is something that all of us have. It's a gift from God, but sadly, many of us have lost it. I want you to use your imagination for a few moments. I want you to think back 2,000 years, okay? Not here on earth, but in heaven. And I want you to imagine the day that God the Father and God the Son decided that it was time for Jesus to be deployed. Now, I chose that word on purpose. When Jesus came to heaven, it was D-Day. It was an invasion. It was a deployment because Jesus came here, as it says in the word, to save his people from their sins. If there would have been a war room in heaven, I can imagine etched on the chalkboard this message, Operation Christmas Hope, because that's what Jesus came to bring to the world. Now, imagine yeah, coming out of that war room was the angel Gabriel. When he steps out of the war room, he sort of has this ashen look on his face as if he's heard things that he couldn't even imagine. And as he sort of stumbles out of the room, along comes Michael, one of the other angels, probably the fierce of all, fiercest of all of God's angels. Michael comes up and says, hey, Gabe, what's wrong? What happened? You just had a wrestling match with Satan? Gabe said, you're not going to believe it. He said, what do you mean? I just heard that Jesus is being deployed to earth. Finally, Michael said, how many squadrons of angels are we going to send? Because Michael had already envisioned how he could marshal all of the angels of heaven and come down here and take care of all the riffraff and all the trouble. Gabe said, no, he's not going to take anybody. He's going by himself. Michael looked at him oddly. What do you mean he's going by himself? He's going by himself. Well, surely Jesus knows what those people are like. If Jesus goes there by himself, they'll kill him. Gabe stopped and said, that's the point. He said, what do you mean that's the point? He said, I just heard that Jesus is going to earth to die. Michael couldn't believe his ears. He said, are you sure? Does the Father know about this? Absolutely. In fact, it was his plan, and Jesus volunteered for it. Well, where are you going in such a hurry, he asked Gabriel. I'm going to Nazareth. Nazareth? Where in the world is Nazareth? What's, it's out there close to Jerusalem. It's a little in the Galilee. You know where Galilee is. Yeah, yeah. Well, why are you going to Nazareth? I'm going to go speak to Jesus' mother. Michael said, his mother? What do you mean, Jesus' mother? Well, he, Gabriel said, well, don't you understand? If Jesus is going to die... 
he has to become human. Human? Jesus is going to become a man? Gabe shook his head. Michael, we got a lot to talk about, and I'm in a hurry. And so they walked off down the corridor as Gabriel tried to explain to Michael what most of us can hardly even fathom, that Jesus became a man in order that he could die to save us from our sins. If you have your Bibles, you'll see this same story unfolded in the words of Luke. In the first chapter of Luke, we find when Gabriel actually arrives in Nazareth to talk to this little girl, this teenage girl by the name of Mary. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, we find the story recorded by, by the gospel writer. As most of you are aware, Luke was a historian. In his, by his own words, he said that he had eyewitness accounts of what he is going to share with us. So there's a high probability that what we're about to read was shared with Luke by Mary herself. Probably some 30-something years after the birth of Jesus. But I'm imagining that these events were as real to Mary as any moment in her life. So listen as, what, as Luke recounts to us what probably Mary shared with him. It says in the 26th verse of Luke chapter 1, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and he said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. All right, well, let's pause there at this point in the story and just sort of catch up with what he, we've just re been told. This is six months after Gabriel had shocked Zechariah in the temple and told him that his wife Elizabeth was going to have a baby. And now Gabriel's sent by God, as the scripture says, to Mary. When he arrives, this is the situation. Mary is a virgin. We're going to talk about that a little more in detail in a few moments. But probably in terms of age, she may have been 15 or 16 years old. Many of the young women of the Middle East, when they got married, they were typically teenagers. And so Mary was not in her late 20s, you know, having had a career. She was probably a teenage girl with her whole life in front of her. She was already engaged. She was pledged to be married to Joseph. Joseph happened also to be a descendant of David. Joseph, as we probably know, it was a carpenter. So as the Jewish tradition was, after you get engaged to your bride-to-be, you go home and build a house. Because part of the wedding ceremony was to bring your bride back to the home that you had built. And so that's what Joseph is probably doing. While Joseph is building the house, Mary is waiting for the day he will come and take her home. And so Mary is 15, 16 years old. She's engaged to Joseph. She lives in this little backwater town called Nazareth. When the angel arrives, you'll notice that the angel, not wanting to terrify the young girl... He says, greetings, you are highly favored, the Lord is with you. The word greetings was just a typical introduction. Good morning would have been another way of saying it. He probably spoke softly. He didn't want to scare her to death. He stands in her presence and he said, good morning, greetings. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. But when I, whenever angels show up, they're going to scare anyone just a little bit. So you'll notice in verse 29, it says that Mary was greatly troubled, not at his presence. It says she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting that this might be. As Mary sat there and talked to Luke about it, she said, Luke, you know, when I saw Gabriel, the thing that shocked me the most is what he just said. What does he mean I'm highly favored that the Lord is with me? The angel recognizing probably from her body language that she was a little bit confused and concerned, he goes on, he says, do not be afraid. You find there in verse uh, 30, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. 
You'll notice that the angel calls her by her first name. He wanted her to know that this was not just some accident that happened. That he had arrived specifically to talk to her and had a message just for her. He said, don't be afraid, Mary. He said, you have found favor in the eye, you have found favor with God. But then things get interesting in verse 31. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. Now, most girls would get embarrassed talking to their mothers about having babies. But here's this angel standing there with her, and he says to this young teenage girl, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now, just about every little girl dreams of having a baby one day, but she probably doesn't dream of an angel informing her that she's going to have a child, particularly not in the circumstances that we're going to find that Mary was in. But the angel goes on and says, and you will call him Jesus. Now, the interesting twist of this story is that according to Jewish tradition, it was not the mother's job to name the baby. That's the dad's job. But the angel says to Mary, Mary, this child, you will name him Jesus. And then the angel goes on in verse 32. He says, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Most scholars believe that if you were to trace the family line of Mary, you could trace it all the way back to the shepherd king David. The Jews being really big into genealogy, I'm sure that that story had been passed on through the ages. I can imagine that when Mary, talked, when Mary heard the angel speaking of the throne of David, she remembers sitting around the campfire with her father. And her father began to recount to her and the other children about how they had a great, great, great grandfather, the shepherd King David, who slayed Goliath with the stones and who was a mighty ruler and about Solomon and all the wonders of the kingdom. But she see, now she sat in a tiny village in the middle of nowhere. No one would have ever dreamed that she was royalty, but you see, the angel knew who she was. And he said, this baby that you will bear, he will sit on his father's throne, the throne of David. And notice in verse 33, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. That's a lot for a 15-year-old to try to get her mind around. Here's this angel from the very throne room of God telling her that she's going to have a baby, and not just any baby. His name's going to be Jesus, and he will sit on David's throne forever. She responds, as you can see in the story in verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Literally in the Greek, what she literally said is, how in the world could this happen? I've never been with a man. I've never known a man. I've never been intimate with men. Joseph and I've never, we, how in the world could this happen? You see, she understood the birds and the bees just like most of us, and she understood how babies come into the world, and she knew that it was absolutely impossible for her to conceive a child. She'd never been with a man. At this point, the angel has given, then given the assignment to explain the impossible. In verse 33, the angel says, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, most of us, we too understand the birds and the bees. And what we have just read is impossible. Virgins don't have babies. It just doesn't happen. There has to be a father. I mean, there just has to be a father. So how in the world could this story be true? 
Well, I personally believe that this is the story of God who became a man. That Jesus was not a man that became a God, but it was God who became a man. For that miracle to happen, God had to get personally involved. And that's what the angel is trying to explain. He said, Mary, first off, what's going to happen is that the Holy Spirit of God is going to get involved in what's about to happen within you. And the Most High will overshadow you. He's trying to describe that there's going to be a moment in Mary's life where God will manifest himself in her in such a way that within her womb will be conceived the Son of God. Jesus was fully human because, you see, Mary was his mother. Blood flowed through his veins. His skin was just like your skin. He had eyes like you. He, he was human, completely human. But according to the angel, he also was conceived by God himself. Why was it necessary for God to become a man? Well, remember the name? His name will be Jesus. The name Jesus in the Hebrew meant Joshua, but literally it meant Jehovah is salvation, or God saves. God's plan from the beginning of time was to save his creation. But as you know, all of us have sinned against God and fallen short of his glory. In order for us to be forgiven, someone had to pay for our sins. And in this case, it had to be the Son of God, the unique, one and only Son of God. You see, when Jesus was deployed, when he came to this earth, he knew that it was a suicide mission. He knew that the cross was his destination. Even at Christmas, he knew why he came here. Jesus came to save us from our sins. And so God himself became a man through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that God-man died on the cross on a Friday afternoon outside of Jerusalem to pay for all of our sins. Should it blow your mind? Absolutely. Is it hard to understand? Incredibly difficult to understand. Is it possible to fully comprehend and explain it? No, it's not. But the only way you can explain Jesus is when you understand who he is and where he came from. And so the angel says to Mary, the Holy Spirit will conceive this child within you. And then he goes on in verse 36, or the last part, he says, This Holy One will be called the Son of God. And then to help her to understand how miracles happen, he adds, Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. As Elizabeth somehow was related to Mary. We don't know exactly the connection. The King James Version says that they were cousins. The actual Greek word that was used meant that there was some kind of blood relation. They were close enough that Mary had already heard the story about Elizabeth. You know how families are. Families talk. And so when Elizabeth got pregnant, it began to spread long before Facebook and text. And the word spread across that part of the world. And little 15, 16-year-old Mary had heard that Elizabeth was going to have a baby. Gabriel said, you know about Elizabeth. You know, she's part of your family. She's having a baby when no one thought anyone of her age could ever have a baby. For nothing is impossible with God. In fact, this translation says that no word from God will ever fail. The word there was rima. It's a word. It's where God speaks. In other words, if God says it's going to happen, it happens. So what was the angel trying to tell us? 
He was trying to tell us how much God loves us. When little Jesus was born and Mary held him in her, in her arms, at some point, Joseph and Mary agreed that his name would be Jesus. Why? Because he would save his people from their sins. You may feel alone. You may feel as if God's a million miles away. But what you feel and what's true are not the same thing. You see, the story of Christmas is that God is not a million miles away. To the God that we worship and serve loves us. He knows our situation. He knows our plight. And he was willing to come into our world so that every single one of us could have a personal relationship with God. If you don't have one, it's because you're missing Christmas. Because that's exactly why Jesus came. Let's bow for prayer together. Oh, Jesus, we thank you that you came into our world. Lord, it's hard for us to even conceive or imagine. The scientists in this room are already scratching their heads and just saying to themselves, that's absolutely impossible. There's no way that could happen. But, Lord, the harsh reality is there are so many things in life that we cannot explain. Or we can put it down in a formula and we, we can somehow chart it out in our feeble little minds. But, Lord, life is a miracle. And why should we doubt that the one that creates life could become a man? Particularly when we understand that you did this miracle for us. Lord, we don't know why you came into our world. It would have been, made a whole lot more sense to release squadrons of angels to wipe off of this planet a creation that had rebelled against you. But instead of rejecting us, you loved us. You died for us. You rose again to give us life. And so, Lord, if there's someone here who's never accepted you as their Lord and Savior, it's our prayer that this morning that they would make that commitment to you that could change their life forever. Because your name is Jesus. God saves. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Bob and I will be here at the front. If there's some kind of public decision you need to make this morning, we would encourage you to come as the Lord moves in your heart. Let's stand and sing together.
As we close our time together, we had the privilege of sitting in on the conversation between Gabriel and Mary. If you remember, Gabriel instructed Mary to name her precious little baby, Jesus. The name Jesus means that God saves us, that God saves us from our sins. And that's why Jesus came into the world, to give himself on the cross, that everything that separates us, separates us from God could be forgiven. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, it's our hope and prayer that this Christmas season that you'd give your heart to Him. You'll discover in trusting Jesus what Christmas is truly all about. And that's why we do what we do. In closing, we do want to wish you a Merry Christmas and thank you for the support of our television ministry. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you'd like to give a gift this Christmas of $25 or more, we'd be honored to send you a copy of the 49th Annual Living Christmas Tree as a gift from us to you. Thank you so much and I hope that you have a wonderful Christmas.